So again, thanks everyone. Thanks for joining us for uh, lessons learned from the COVID-19 pandemic. Uh, we have a panel discussion that we're gonna, we're gonna start here. We're gonna chat through some of the things we learned, some of the things we added to our place, maybe a few Our things we took off of. Um, and I think that I would start maybe with and just- I think uh, that I would start maybe with just- If everyone could share their name, their title, maybe a little bit about your career path, sort of how you got to where you are now. So I, I can kick things off. I'm uh, James Seidler. I'm the Director of Web Services at Purdue University Northwest, which is uh, near Chicago. Um, and I actually came on my career, sort of worked in communications and marketing for a variety of nonprofits, including some zoos and aquariums, uh, before coming to higher ed about three years ago. So it's been an interesting change for me. Um, Amy, would you like to go next? Sure. I'm Amy Patton. I'm located in Cassidy. Can you hear me? Sorry. I can hear myself. Um, I worked for Park University. Um, before that, I um, was started at an actually an ad agency that specialized in higher education where I worked for a few years. And then I was recruited to Park um, as the director of marketing responsible for digital advertising. And then my role expanded just to be director of marketing. And I've been here at Park University for five years. Kenzie, would you like to go next? Oh, certainly. Hi, I'm Kenzie Woodbridge. I work at the British Columbia Institute of Technology. I have actually worked there um, for 21 years now, uh, and I work in the IT services department. My primary focus uh, is on um, documentation for our users and also our internal documentation and uh, our technical training, specifically for faculty and staff and using all of our IT provided tools, including WordPress. Great. And Bonnie, I know you may be in the midst of a storm. Are, are you able to in introduce yourself? Well, it sounds like Bonnie may not be able to introduce herself right now, but uh, we can certainly come back and look to loop Bonnie into the conversation. Bonnie, I hope you are safe with a storm bearing down on you, certainly. Um, well, well, maybe to get started, we're going to be focusing on lessons learned from COVID. But I thought it might be helpful to even start out by just sort of talking about what COVID looked like at our institution, sort of uh, you know, what, what was the baseline? Uh, what has your journey been between perhaps remote and in-person? Uh, Kenzie, would you want to start with, with your journey there? Uh, sure. So um, we're actually the second largest post-secondary in the province of British Columbia. Um, so we have, you know, 45,000 students, 3,000 faculty and staff. And uh, as of March 17th, 2020, um, you know, we were given basically two days to transition from being a primarily in-person institution to being an entirely online uh, institution. And um, that transition was very quick <laughs> and pretty tricky, um, in part because some of the tools that we really did need, we didn't have at the time, uh, at, the, at the start of the pandemic, you know, on March 17th, our uh, video chat conference tool for faculty and staff was uh, WebEx. And uh, in the first two days of uh, the pandemic, you know, being at home part, uh, we uh, managed to take down the entire phone system <laughs> for the institution several times because it was tied in with that. And so we had to, within three days, move to uh, launching Zoom for the entire institution, and uh, so we had to train everybody on that, get the bongo up and running in the uh, uh, learning management system, all those sorts of things. Um, so it was, you know, a big stressful time, but we transitioned to it, and then we have been transitioning back to having some in-person because so many of our programs are technical trades kind of programs, hands-on, it's very difficult to do all of that online forever. But those programs managed to transition to uh, blended fairly early in the pandemic by by last fall. Um, so by last fall, I think we were 40% very carefully, very, um, you know, with lots of precautions uh, in person, actually, and 60% uh, fully online. Um, and we're trying to transition further, you know, uh, keep coming back. We had a plan for everyone to be fully in person by this fall. However, you know, as we all know, uh, it hasn't turned out that way in the way that we would have wanted it to. So it's been, it's been quite a journey and, you know, 
we weren't exactly doing nothing before uh, the pandemic started. We had other big projects that we were working on, like, for instance, migrating our entire website from our former CMS to WordPress <laughs> and, uh, you know, retraining our entire user base and all those sorts of things and upgrading that tool and this tool and the other tool. And so, like, all of those things had to continue happening as well. And I'll just say, as a, you know, as a very um, jokey thing, that uh, one of the things I learned from the pandemic is that I talk with my hands and more broadly than fits in the Zoom window. So I apologize <laughs> for that. Anyway, that's probably uh, enough for me. Your, your note about um, sort of migration is very timely for our experience too, because I will share, we were sort of fortunate in that we launched a redesigned website uh, 12 days before we closed uh, for the pandemic. and. In some ways, I'm very grateful that happened because if we had not launched at that time, I think we would have launched one year later. <laughs> Maybe it would have been a pretty long window. But um, something that, that I would bring up is it was also very beneficial to us because as part of the redesign process, we had a lot of outdated info, a lot of, you know, you know how things are. There are pages that get neglected, contact infos out of date, things like that. And really, we winnowed things down and had it very lean and focused um, going into the pandemic. So I think that at least was a bit of a boon and that we didn't have people contacting and looking up info on pages that were two years out of date. We'd sort of been through that crucible and we're ready in some sense, although I think it's hard to, I don't think anyone could ever truly be ready. <laughs> no, I agree with you. And, uh, you know, I think if we'd had any leeway in our system, we might have um, put off some of that migration stuff, but our former CMS shut the lights off and oh. walked out of the room when we were out of there. We were their last customer and they were desperate for us to get out. So we didn't have a choice. We had to proceed oh. with that. But, yeah. Wow. And how about you, Amy? What was what was sort of your, your timeline like on the COVID front? Yeah, so we have kind of a diverse offering. So I'm up here just outside of Kansas City in Parkville, Missouri, where we have a traditional residential campus. And then we have actually 41 locations across the United States. Um, 32 of them on military installations. And wow. then we have another um, campus that's focused on sports out in Gilbert, Arizona, which just launched a couple years ago. And so it was really interesting. I mean, we pivoted as fast as everyone else. We were fortunate that we already had an online offering. And so that pivot, I don't think was as dramatic as some other people had to make. However, we were kind of at the mercy of state regulations, right? So hmm. the military, what they were doing, whether or not our campuses were open on those military installations. Um, so from my perspective, what I had to manage, especially with our website, was all of these different location pages and very different statuses depending on um, by state wh whether they were open or closed. And obviously, almost everybody was closed at one point, but, you know, it happened at various times. Wow. Um, and so there was so much information that we were managing. I was just remembering we launched our website I think it was three, almost four years ago. And the day I launched mine was during an ice storm in Kansas oh, <laughs> So it's like <laughs> pandemic, <something>. ice storm, <laughs> right? Um, but I was just having flashbacks to that. So um, yeah, so we were managing kind of like all of this different state information, wow. as well as federal, as well as what our campus was um, doing, various different audiences, right? So we have grad and undergrad and residential and commuter and it was just like gathering all of that information and what was the strategy so like where were we going to put it all how were we going to keep track of it where was kind of the main hub of that information going to be and so yeah we we pivoted quickly like everyone else but we were already we already had online most everything was online except for things that had like labs and different mm -hmm. things and they did have to pivot as quickly as you're talking about and there were some obstacles that had to be um, they had to overcome for sure it wasn't seamless um, just like everybody in higher ed we had our pain points um, but we were in a better place I think because we already had a decent online offering so Wow, yeah, it, it was like just all of the different locations. Yeah, almost 30 COVID experiences versus <laughs> yeah, one there, right. it seems. Yeah. I got very <laughs> familiar with Arizona's COVID policies <laughs> and Kansas and Missouri, I mean, all over the United States. So, wow. Well, well, one thing, you know, that we had to come to mind is sort of the biggest challenge you faced. And I know one challenge that we face, and this would be intensified for you, Amy, is just sort of trying to sort through the sheer volume of information out there. And then also determining what was relevant at a given time, what was no longer relevant, sort of the balance also about keeping people informed about COVID with important info, but also just trying to go about our business of someone requesting a transcript or wanting to 
come to the community counseling center, some of those things. So that the real balance is almost just juggling the information. So it's almost like information architecture on a different scale in a way. And it, it sounds like, Kenzie, you had a, a range of challenges, sort of the speed. What, what do you think the, the biggest challenge you face in your instance would be? Yeah, it's a good question. Um, sorry, I should have prepared better for this question. Yeah. Uh, I think part of it is just that there was a lot of, um, you know, we've been around a long time, you know, in post-secondary people also work at one place for a long time. And so people get pretty embedded in the systems they know. And if those yeah. systems aren't going to work for mobile or remote, you have the additional challenge, not only of like, here, we've launched a new tool, but like, we also have to convince you, <laughs> persuade you that this is the thing that is actually going to help you, that it's going to solve your problems. And that, you know, I think it's very clear that if you, whatever strong foundation you have before you get to the crisis, you're going to lean on that really heavily. Yeah. And um, I think there were areas where we didn't realize we didn't have as strong a foundation, um, you know, or we were reliant on technology that was years out of date and that wasn't going to be flexible enough to let us make this transition to online and things like that. And that I think that's where the challenges were. The neglect, you get by with the neglected yeah. little things until suddenly rah, you've got to really <laughs> do better. But... Well, it's funny, you mentioned you were a WebEx environment, uh, as were we, and not to knock on WebEx, but we, we don't use that very much anymore. It seems like the, this experience, we pivoted to different services pretty quickly um, yeah. in that regard. <laughs> exactly. How about you, Amy? Any challenges um, that you wanted to, to mention? Yeah, I think it was just how to prioritize, right? So the website became the main hub of mm. information. And so um, it kind of changed priority um, in how we were delivering information to the university and really all eyes were on it, um, both internally and externally. And so everybody thought that their information was the most important thing. Yeah. And so how did we as a team prioritize um, the requests and what was the most important thing. And then sometimes we would get the information and maybe it wasn't in the most user-friendly format. And so what did we have the liberty to, to wordsmith? What were we rewriting and editing versus, and what was going up versus not, not going up? And what did, what was the approval process? So um, we had to kind of set that standard um, and, and work with kind of our leadership team to say, you know, we need these systems in place to make sure that the information that's going up is the correct information. Because I felt like, you know, it's people were hungry for correct information. We couldn't make mistakes. Mm -hmm. um, it was, uh, people were very stressed out. It was, yeah. it's a p pandemic. And so they're dealing with a personal crisis and this professional issue at the same time. And so I just felt like there, we were, we had to step it up even that much more. We couldn't be making mistakes about mask mandates and, and you know, requirements for working from home and, you know, all of these things, uh, how to log in online and just all of that stuff. We just didn't want to put any misinformation out there that would cause even more confusion and panic um, and stress in an already stressful environment. Yeah, I, I can really relate. I feel like... Um someone overseeing the website, we became the decision maker mm -hmm. on, uh, in some areas that, frankly, I wasn't always comfortable with. But right. you, you are the last sort of point of action before publication, and you're getting very complex information. You're trying to distill down and simplify. And I'd often be worried if I was doing anything wrong with it, but people wanted the info up. They almost seemed happy yes. to have someone do it, too. Mm -hmm. <laughs> Yeah, it was like you were wrangling the information. Yeah. Um, I kind of viewed that as my role and also reaching out and saying, as a user, I haven't gotten an update yet. I need an yeah. update. Um, and so going to the, the COVID committee and saying, it's ta time for you guys to be giving me more information because as a user, it's time. And that was a role I was playing. Yeah, no, I agree with that. Mm -hmm. um, Kenzie, you talked a bit about the shift to uh, online instruction. You know, how did the tools you have in place assist people in making that shift? And did you find that you were able to sort of meet their their anticipated needs? Did you have to even pivot as you pivoted, did you find? Well, I'll be honest with you. Um, 
at our institution, IT services and the learning and teaching center are two separate um, yeah. departments, which I actually think is a problem. I, I don't think this is the best way because then we have, if people are working with technology, they think it's an IT services problem, but quite often it isn't in this case. Um, so we were already using um, desire to learn um, as our learning management system. We've been using it for many years now. And every instructor, whether in person or distance, was already using it to manage, you know, things. So I think that familiarity was a was a good thing to have already. I say everyone was using it. They weren't. No, everyone had access to it. Everyone, every class had it provisioned, but it wasn't, I don't think everyone was using it. And so for some people, there was that learning curve. And I know that um, my counterparts, the people who do training and who support users in the Learning and Teaching Center were just as busy, if not busier than me, they were struggling. And yeah, so I think part of the problem that we did have was that uh, you were talking about information and make sure you're wrangling the information. Well, we have a distributed web publishing uh, situation. So we have publishers in all these embedded things, which means who is holding it together, who is pulling it together. And likewise, you know, we have Bongo and we have Zoom which do you use for your class? And some people really prefer Zoom, but they're supposed to use Bongo because it's in the tool. And, you know, like, I think that coordination of those tools and pulling all of those things together and pulling all the information together is a very, there's, you know, entropy is real. The pull towards entropy, towards more chaos and less order, it, it's, it's true in big organizations. And uh, that, I think... Yeah, it was one of the challenges there where some of the stuff we had to support uh, faculty and staff and students was already in place, but people weren't using it. In some cases, it was hard to know uh, what people should be using. And that was a, sure. a challenge. Yeah. It, it's interesting, you know, sort of that we're in a distributed um, environment as well. But for COVID, I think that was one case where we sort of came to a consensus. No, this all has to live in one central spot. We, we need sort of the COVID info, even if, you know, it's the library or different departments or units, and maybe they'd have a note on their site or something, but we really did try to funnel everything centrally to almost one COVID microsite. Um, and we found that there were challenges. We probably made like five COVID microsites over the span of the pandemic thus far, but at least I was helpful to sort of centralize in one way. And, and I just want to join you, Kenzie, in giving a shout out our Office of Instructional Technology and Center for Faculty Excellence. A lot of people would think that uh, my area would oversee online instruction. We did not. They did wonderful work and a great job. And I can't imagine. We tried to support them with guides and, and things, as you know, sort of thinking of different users. And Amy, as you know, they're trying to come at it from a user perspective and maybe not have 75 bullet points in a row, uh, try to prioritize and, and call it the real big stuff. But um, it was a lot of collaboration going on. But And, and I think that that triaging was, was such a big part of it. Um, yeah, what would you say, Amy? Yeah, no, we centralize anyway. So when we launched our website, that's how we do it. And so we already had people kind of trained for that, which was good um, and helpful. But I agree. I placed um, information on various pages throughout the website because we had our kind of COVID microsite as well. But sometimes, you're right, people went other places and still needed that COVID updated hours or the latest information. And so we created kind of a central document which kept where we placed all that because I knew down the road we'd have to, to change it or take it off or what did I do with it so um, that's how we managed all of that information and knowing where it was um, so that we could easily go in and take it off or update it that way yeah one thing I'll note sort of riffing on that is um we knew along the way that reverting would be a challenge sure, we, we changed a lot of things to make the you know to share COVID updates and it's been more of a challenge because it's so much longer, frankly. I, I laugh and think back, we're like, oh, in a month or so, we'll be back. We'll just <laughs> unpublish and roll everything back. And now those updates are so deeply enmeshed in the site that it's like starting over, which may be a good thing. It's been two years. <laughs> well, but some of them were really helpful. Like we launched a, an online learning page. Yeah. And we're keeping that. Like yeah. it's doing beautifully. So yeah. like, um, <laughs> but I would have never thought that we needed that prior to this uh, pandemic. And so that was a good thing that came out of it. Yeah, that actually is. You know, one question we had had is, are there things that changes like that that you made that you think you will keep or, or trends from going virtual perhaps that, that might sustain? 
Yeah, so we also had more, we have a virtual tour for like a residential students and we leaned on that very heavily. So like from a positioning mm -hmm. place on our website that went to the top, um, we pushed everybody to that because obviously they couldn't come to campus. And I think that's a change that's going to stay. So, you know, having our admissions representatives walk people through that virtual tour and leaning uh, much, you know, more heavy on that virtual tour experience is something that's going to stay. Um, you know, talking about online um, and how most of our degrees are online or hybrid um, is something that isn't going to go away. Um, I think that the expectation now is that, at least for the type of students that we reach, that that that's how their learning is going to be. And so um, I'm finding me, I'm using it more and more in advertising language, and I think that's going to continue. Hmm. I, I'll know, much like you, we created a virtual tour. Um, I think something, almost like you were saying, Ken, it's something we'd wanted to do for a while anyway, something we knew we needed to do, and this is the spur, oh boy, we better do it now. So we sort of have a first version up and working toward a second. And another thing I'll just personally call it is I, I've enjoyed we seem to be in a hybrid space for larger meetings and webinars like this. And personally, I enjoy that because that makes it easier for me to to be, weirdly, to be present for some of these meetings that might be hard to make it to in person. Um, it seems like it's more accessible in, in that sense. It, how about you, Kenzie? Are there things that sort of changes you've implemented that you think will stick that have, have proven to be good changes? Um, I think there's quite a few, actually. And this isn't necessarily website related or WordPress related, but one of the things that we did was launch a tool that lets us deploy academic software, the software people need for instruction and for learning, to people's individual personal devices rather than yeah. having to have it installed specifically in labs. And that is something we're going to continue with. And in fact, in labs, they're just going to use it, that same tool in the lab. So you can go to any lab to do those sorts of things, that kind of thing. Um, one of the things that's actually pretty important, and I'm actually very wary about whether this is going to continue, is I think very imperfectly we managed to make a bit more space for parents, for caregivers, for people who are disabled, people who are chronically ill to participate in a variety of ways and in, you know, have a little more flexibility to take care of the people, including themselves, that they need to take care of. And um, like not to the extent that we should have, you know, that's my <laughs> political statement, but more than we ever had before. And I am worried that with the return to work, we're going to let that progress go. And uh, that's a thing I would hope could continue a little more flexibility for, yeah. Yeah, I'd even, um, one thing that I didn't think of too is actually during, during the pandemic and sort of related to that, is we hired on my team our first fully remote worker, um, someone who they, they come in a few times a year. Um, they, they come in for a, bi a big meeting or something like that, perhaps. But day to day, they work remote. Um, and that, that is, frankly, pretty different for us. It's not something that we re really had in place. But especially during the pandemic, when we're all working flexibly and we're all able in a distribu distributed sense to update the site, you know, it was a great time for it. And it's proven very successful. So it's almost in line with what you're saying, Kenzie. It's something that has worked so well. It perhaps took the pandemic to get us to try that, but it's really been successful. And I would certainly, you know, I'd hope that'd be something we could embrace for the, the right circumstance too. We did the exact same thing on my team. Really? I just hired somebody in Texas. Yes. And I never would have thought that prior to this, everybody was in here in Parkville or in Kansas City area. And yeah, we just hired our first person on our web services team and she's out of Texas. Yeah. Uh, so I, I think it's great. Yeah. It's funny. We'd all be on Zoom meetings. I'd be with one person in Evanston and then one person of one floor down and <laughs> yeah. it didn't make too much difference really uh, in the big picture. <laughs> um, well, one question I had, um, something I'm curious about, and I, I can actually speak a little bit about this one is, uh, how did COVID perhaps affect what you track or, or noticeable changes or trends that you saw? And um, something that I might kick off, I, I can share a couple of things. Like I said, we just done the redesign um, so we were fortunate in that since we sort of streamlined the site, but we also built in a better process for um, collecting student inquiries. If you're interested in finance or nursing or something like that. So in one sense, we were very fortunate because we saw a whole year of just great year over year increases because we had a better system for getting people in. So in a time when things could have seemed pretty tough, I think we were pretty fortunate on that timing. Um, but I, I'd also know we saw a decline in web traffic year over year, anywhere from users to anywhere from maybe 
sometimes 10 to 30% at times, it was noticeable. Um, but something I sort of took heart from was that the decline in traffic wasn't all necessarily meaningful. And that I think a good portion of it was people like me or people in a computer lab who uh, log on and perhaps it's the homepage on the, the, um, the, excuse me, browser that loads and they click off and don't do anything anyway. And we got a lot of sort of phantom page use for that. And we're actually looking at better systems, maybe making an alternate landing page on campus or something like that to filter that out. But uh, I guess I almost felt fortunate that the declines in traffic we're seeing weren't necessarily catastrophic declines in, in sort of recruitment and prospect interest and even some of our service to faculty and current students. I think some of those internal audiences became a little more comfortable with using their portals and, and things on the site. Um, you know, any, any trends that you saw? Kenzie, any, anything you'd want to share? Um, I don't think we started tracking things differently, but what we did start doing, we'd already had a whole bunch of tracking kind of metrics available to us, but we weren't necessarily referring to them very often, maybe. Uh, but it, it was very useful to be able to go in and take a look at those things. And actually, like one of the things that I'm responsible for is our knowledge base, our documentation for our users, faculty, staff and students. And uh, we've had Google Analytics on that for years. I can tell you it was a big uptick in uh, usage of that tool because, you know, suddenly people do need it's not as convenient to just walk over to the service desk or, or what have you. And they were being sent these resources more frequently. Um, but also there are all sorts of metrics in there where I'm looking for for a long time, the question of well, what are people searching for that there is no result for that wasn't a very useful metric because there weren't a lot of things. We had most of what people were searching for that work was already done, but now that's a really important metric uh, because, you know, that helped us to identify like what are the things that are missing from our documentation? What is the support stuff that doesn't exist or that we need to better tag or keyword or all the different things to make sure that it's more visible. And so that that's one aspect of it that not so much that we track things differently, but that we started paying better attention to what we were tracking because it suddenly mattered a lot more. Yeah, that, that makes a lot of sense. I'd say we, as you know, it's almost a stress test for some of the support. You know, you'd hear much more quickly if you weren't supporting people or giving them the info they needed really across the spectrum from faculty, staff and technical things to prospective students wondering if we're going to be test optional the next year, the, the whole range of it. Um, there's a lot of instant feedback <laughs> for people who are online more, maybe. <laughs> how, how about you, Amy? Yeah, so I saw a lot of the same things that you were talking about. So our website traffic did go down, just like you said, um, but some really interesting trends, which was our applications were up, um, but our general inquiries were down. Um, you know, there was a lot of concern about, you know, people not wanting to go to school because of the pandemic. And so, you know, we pivoted quickly um, to, to help drive traffic and to continue to prop up that traffic. And so I launched um, targeted SEO projects to try to help that, um, you know, the traffic that we could find. Um, so I thought that it was a good time to start really working on a lot of that. We always work on it on an ongoing basis, but I really added some extra SEO projects um, to help boost any traffic that was out there. Um, to optimize it the best that I could um, and, and to make the most out of it. So yeah, we did see that, um, like I said, some pages rose to the top, like those online learning page, that online learning page I was talking about, um, which I hadn't seen before. Um, some degree programs switched priority, um, which was interesting. Um, so we did see a shift in what people were looking for from a degree standpoint. Um, and like I said, the location pages changed because of who was open and who wasn't and who was searching that information. So yeah, we put a lot of work into our website this past year to, to keep the traffic that was going there good. And it's it's okay, like we're doing all right, but it, it did, we had to roll up our sleeves and get in there a little bit more than we, we normally do. Yeah, I, I can relate. We, we saw some interesting changes too in that uh, graduate studies increased pretty notably for us. I think understandably people perhaps going through career challenges or transitions um, saying, hey, what's next for me? And, and the graduate programs rose up even higher on sort of our inquiries we had coming in. And then uh, just anecdotally, even we're, we have strength is in nursing and things like that. That's sort of a core program for us. But nursing and health studies and things related to that, I don't know if it's 
just the sense of it being in the news, but those went up too, which was really interesting. Um, yeah, I'm not same with us, and I, really? I'm surprised by that because there was such a call to action for yeah. nursing, and so I think you know it was almost like I was watching our website and I could predict the news story that was going to come out. Um, yeah. You know, it was just we were so reflective of what was going on in the society, um, and and that's one of it, which is this call to action to to help and nursing and healthcare and things like that. Yeah are a part of the time and, and what's needed. And so, and then you see people stepping up and searching that stuff out. Yeah, it, it was sort of inspirational. Yeah. <laughs> no way <laughs> almost to see it. <laughs> Braver than I, I suppose. These yeah. Pretty heroic. <laughs> uh, we, we also have a, quite a few, we have a fairly major nursing program and a bunch of other health programs. I'll be honest, I don't know about the, you know, increase in enrollment. Enrollment is always full in those programs, even in non-pandemic times. Yeah. Um, but one of the things that did happen uh, over the pandemic is that our provincial government decided that as a, you know, trying to, you know, help people out while employment was down because people were off work, was they created, they funded a uh, micro-credential uh, thing oh. so that we had these little micro-programs and micro-credentials that we had to then suddenly offer and suddenly advertise and um, at no cost to um, to students and that was uh, quite a thing to get to make happen in a in a very rapid way um, but fortunately we were able to do that with our existing systems with some modifications but what yeah was that, that was, timeline like was it pretty pretty intense? Oh, it, yeah it was pretty intense um, because we're not just talking about you know, putting some new content up on our website. People yeah. also had to develop the courses that were being offered in, you know, like five seconds. Thank you very much. Um, and it was a, like a one-time offer in a way, right? Like, here's yeah. this bunch of money from the government. Go to town, my friend. You <laughs> like, yeah. this has got to happen in no time. Um, so that was quite a flurry of activity uh, in, in January, as I recall. Wow. I think it might have been a, a month, maybe a month and a half. It was unclear... You know, it was sort of, is this going to happen? Maybe there were rumors, and then suddenly, yes. <laughs> we need it live. <laughs> Go. Yeah. So yeah. that was uh, that was another, never done that before. Yeah. I, yeah. I can relate that speed of uh, from thought to action seemed to intensify uh, during this period. <laughs> Absolutely. Um, well, you know, one question I'm always interested in is, uh, were there things you were able to stop doing that you think you have truly been able to stop doing that you you might not pick up again or old ways of doing things that this provided a good excuse to to reconsider and leave behind i know one thing i can share is um it's been interesting as we sort of come back i i think that we've seen um people who understand i almost want to revert back to the way things were even pre-pandemic with some branding decisions and things we changed and we're really trying, for instance, to stay away from um, the process of creating maybe one-off flyers or this sort of print category, things that aren't as strategic, mm -hmm. perhaps. Everyone has their own approach, but there can be anything that's sort of one-off print piece for trying to say, well, what's the big picture here, and how can we make this a campaign and a strategy a little more? So that might be the one thing where we're getting the request. We're trying to at least push back a little on that, uh, and redirect them, perhaps, I should say, instead. Uh, Amy, you laugh. I wonder if you see that. <laughs> I'm right in the middle of doing the exact same thing. <laughs> we just don't have time for that anymore. It's just kind of that uh, put a request in, design it from scratch, and produce it. For, it's just not, we don't, we can't anymore. And so, yeah, so I think more from an internal approach um, and how we are working has changed and streamlined and become faster and we've gotten rid of a lot of the bloat um, and sharing of information um, you know uh, you know we set up a, a distribution way like I said I oversee all marketing so maybe this isn't WordPress specific but you know sharing all that information across multiple channels so when we do create that that one piece if we decide to create it it's shared out among multiple people who can use it instead of just delivering to that one person um, and so we've changed a lot of the way that we accept requests and then what we're delivering um, it's just we're just working i think a little bit smarter um, definitely and the, the types of requests we're getting are different from the university too and so it's just i think 
there's been a shift. There's been a change. I can't put my finger on what that is, um, but I just see it as changing. So. Yeah, sir. I, I agree. Kenzie, is that match your experience? Do you have anything to share on that front? Uh, well, one of the things is that BCIT had never permitted um, telework. There was no work from home arrangements, basically, for anyone, except if, you know, like, they're coming to test my fire alarm, I got to be home, that kind of thing, as an ad hoc, but, um, and, and faculty, okay, they have a little more flexibility than those of us who are staff or admin, but um, there was no, you know, regular work from home arrangements at all. And then, and there was no appetite for it. People pushed for it. And, you know, leadership was always like, no, no, my friends, this is, <laughs> this is how we do this. We are on, on campus all the time. And, um, of course, we had to rapidly transition to everyone working from home, which meant that we could actually, now we had a real good excuse to launch all the tools that would support that, like a VPN that had more than 300 seats, which is what we had on day one of the pandemic. Um, and uh, all these, you know, the software delivery system that I already mentioned, and, um, you know, Zoom and all of these sorts of things. We didn't have any of that. Now we have that. One of the things that is happening is as we are returning to work, um, not to the extent that some of my colleagues would like, but now we do have an official remote work policy. And um, although there won't be any fully 100% remote um, positions, and everyone will be expected to work at least 50% of the time on campus, but 49% of the time they can work from home as they arrange it with their, their managers and, and so on. And that, it's not, as I say, it's not what some of my colleagues who are like, I can do all my work from home and I do not need to be in person with you. They're very, they're very angry at the moment. <laughs> it's, a, it's a very anxious, frustrating time for lots of people, but it's progress that we, had no sense would be happening at all. Like there was no movement on that for years and years. And now, yeah, there's going to be remote work and that is new and that is continuing. So. Yeah, that's great. I know we had to launch a VPN two uh, network to handle the, the extra request for a while uh, during the process. So uh, a lot that seems relatable here <laughs> for us and I hope for the audience as well. Um, and, and I will say, if, if anyone out there has questions, I have an eye on the question tab, so feel free to end, uh, or excuse me, ask any questions, although we're coming up on our time here. So I thought I would sort of maybe close out, um, unless we get questions, with, with one last thought, just is there anything you'd want to share that we haven't touched on maybe as, as a lesson learned uh, from COVID? Anything that, that stands out that you want to come back to? Uh, Amy, do you want to start? Yeah, I think that the thing that I've taken away from this is, um, a really good relationship with our our uh, web design company. Like we have an incredible partnership with them. We were in contact with them throughout. Um, I have real confidence that if I have to pivot again, and you know we did it once, we can do it again, um, and that we can do it. Um, so I think I've built up the confidence of the team, confidence in myself professionally, confidence in my vendor um, that we. We pivoted fast uh, in the middle of a, a national, an international crisis, and we did it. And uh, I can do it again. Um, and with the right team in place, and the right people, um, and the right systems, and you know all those things, that it is possible to do it again. And so I don't, you know, I I'm okay with the future. So we, we may have to do this again. Um, who knows what the future holds? But I know that now that we've done it once, it's okay if we have to do it again. So I think that's the biggest thing. That, that's great. Uh, Kenzie, <laughs> how about you? Uh, I just, I would just go back and emphasize uh, something I sort of mentioned in passing previous, which is that the foundation that you build up in non-crisis times is critical for when the crisis comes. Because we had experienced trainers people who do this technical training, like me, but not just me, because we already had an established knowledge base, user documentation for people to rely on, because we also had, and you know, this is one of my passions, we had good relationships, relationships of trust and integrity that we had built up with our users. 
those were things that we could rely on when we had to make this rapid shift. And if we hadn't had those things, we couldn't have made any of that happen, anything like as elegantly as quickly. And that's, so what I would say is it's really important. Sometimes it's, those things can get neglected. Like there's a lot of hustle bustle busyness all the time. Um, and especially things like documentation or training, it feels like you can sort of put it off, put it off, put it off, put it off. But it'll come back and bite you in the, in the rear end if you don't, yeah. if you don't have it. Um, and so I think I, I would encourage everyone who has the opportunity to advocate for it strongly when you can, um, because it is so critical when the, when the rubber hits the road. Your answers are both so inspirational. <laughs> I love it. That's great. <laughs> and, and I would say, Kenzie, riffing on what you said, I know I, I mentioned sort of we launched the website right before um, the pandemic hit, but beyond sort of the work that had gone into that and sort of the winnowing down and the things I mentioned, uh, one thing that was really good about that is the relationships. I think you're you're saying exactly right in that we developed relationships with people across campus and having the conversations and defining priorities and we'd all agreed on a lot as part of the website redesign. That's maybe more important than the actual redesign itself is that we knew who to talk to. We, we'd agreed on what our, our sort of strategy and focus was, and we knew what the lines of communication were too. And, and without that, it would have been, I mean, this has been difficult, obviously difficult for different people in different ways too, but if we hadn't had those communications and relationships, it, it would have been impossible. I think it would have been, 50 people trying to talk to 50 different people all the time. So it, it would have been really challenging. Um, so I think that's a great takeaway is, yeah, if you invest in these resources beforehand, before the crisis hits, you can really benefit. And then you're right, Amy, knowing that you can do it. I mean, we not would have made it this far and are continuing to change. So that's great. Well, we are we are two minutes ahead of our time. I'm not sure, uh, Amy or Kenzie, if you have any any final thoughts you want to share? No, thanks for having me though. This was great. It was, I think, a very uh, great discussion. Yeah, I, this was wonderful. Thank you both very much. I, I also share, we heard from Bonnie that she is fine, thankfully, in, <laughs> in the storm, but uh, her power is knocked out. So she, she is unfortunately not able to join us, but she is okay. So <laughs> at least that's resolved on that front. Well, <laughs> thank, thank you both very much. And thank you to WP Campus, obviously, for hosting us. Um, this has been really great. and I, I've enjoyed hearing from and learning from both of you. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thanks.